Welcome, friends, to another episode of the Pick 6 Podcast. Uh, we took a break for a week, but we are back. And I I actually have some mail days to uh, show and some pickups, recent pickups, some of which have been on Instagram, and I can't wait to, to demonstrate them. And we got the, the fancy light here so we can really see the cards in all their glory. Um, but, Drake, how you doing, bud? DPZ, I'm doing well. I missed you uh, last week. It was a it was a busy week. It's like uh, next you you think it's Monday and you got the whole week ahead of you, and then next thing you know you blink and it's Friday. I was actually back up in Elmira, New York, on a work trip, uh, celebrating a, a, a safety achievement with our folks up there, and uh, they they actually asked me to get into a dunk tank, and it'd been a while since I'd gotten into a dunk tank, and. Um, it, 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 it was it was great fun, except the water temp was out of a water hose. It was a little chilly. It was about 72, 72 degrees, kind of the outside air temperature. And you're just sitting there and you really don't know when somebody's going to hit that target, right? Because somebody's throwing one and it's wild. And, you know, the next thing they know, they're dead on and you're going splashing down into the water. And it was uh, it was freezing cold. But um, but it was all in the name of fun, and it, it was fun to, you know, it's a work day, but you get to act like a kid again. So um, cool. it was a great time last week with that. And uh, so, and, and then get home and then headed to Tulsa, and I took my my son to his first ever WWE SmackDown event. Um, cool. And he had a great time with that. And that was, that was actually my first, like, WWE event. I was talking to my wife that I'd been to in at least, like, 15 years, which is really sad as, as big of a fan I am. But uh, – so I was glad to take him, and he had a great time. So, um, yeah, just trying to finish up summer, and kids go back to school uh, next week. So <clears throat> looking forward to that. Very cool. Yeah, well, I'm going to be heading to, I think, the Seattle version of that here next month with a bunch of my buddies. Um, uh, one of my buddies, uh, Adam, is a, we're, we're both big Ric Flair fans. So um, obviously he's not going to be there, but uh, – Excited to go. I've never been to one, so I, it'll be my first, and uh, it'll be a good time with the guys. Anyway, uh, first, before we launch into questions or, or mail days or pickups, I do want to give you a hard time, because I finally caught up on the crossover yesterday while mowing the lawn um, and, and driving around you know, to and from, and I, I caught the last question you asked on the crossover, and I have to tell you, man, what are you doing? What is a question like? Are NFTs and cards and vaults the same thing? And I'm like, Drake, you're getting lazy, man. Usually your questions are thought-provoking, intriguing. And this one, I think the guys were thrown. They're like, is this really a Drake question? Or is there someone masquerading as Drake asking this question? I'm like, Drake, what kind of question is that? I thought they handled it really well, and they are trying to be graceful. But I had to give you a hard time because that question was just so funny. Like, what are you talking about, bro? Like, of course they're different. They're they're. We can hold them in our hands. They're the same. They're just they're just somewhere else, right? For a minute, but they're not like some digital thing that's that's different. But I wanted to ask, what prompted that question? Like, what, 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 where, how did you come up with that? Yeah, so so Chris kind of hinted at a little bit, and I thought it was a it was interesting thing, and they certainly handled it well. And you know, sometimes when you ask a question, the way you ask it and the way people interpret it can be different, right? But, you know, and, and Chris did mention, so Spinatron, right? He's the king of like blockchain NFT stuff. And he talks about it all the time and that whole sort of thing. And he was sharing pictures like, hey, here's my Panini blockchain card. And then here's the guy that has the physical card. And they were kind of sharing it next to each other. And, um, and, then, and, and then I saw some other people that, you know, it wasn't many, but um, just talking about how the blockchain cards and how great it is because, you know, you don't really have to worry about shipping. And, you know, if you want to transfer the, you can put it out there on the, oh, what's it called? The, the, in the ether world or whatever that's called or whatever, it's way beyond me. And then you can put a price on it. Somebody can buy it. They instantly own it, right? Um, it's kind of the way. And there's that, that, that's kind of why, you know, the NFT blockchain people say that, you know, there's less friction in that market. And, you know, you don't have to package something up and take it to the post office and do all that sort of thing. And so it, it, I, I saw that and I kind of chuckled about that and that whole sort of thing. Well, there's actually a guy um, who I met with at the National and I had a card that I had not shipped out of my Fanatics Collect vault. And I said, well, well, hey, do you have a Fanatics Collect vault? And he said, yes, I've never really used it though or something like that. And I said, and I said okay, well, let's, let's meet up at the National 
and let me transfer it from my vault to yours. And so we meet up and, and I said, Hey, what's your vault code? And he said, here it is. And, you know, we're next to each other. He copied and uh, put through it in a direct message, sent it over to me. I copied and pasted it into the thing. I hit, you know, create request. And like instantly the card went from my vault to his vault. And I was like, well, that's kind of interesting. Like, you know, like we never touched the card. We obviously own the physical collectible and that whole sort of thing. But there was no like shipping to me, me shipping to him, package things up, that whole sort of thing. It was just a throw in a code, hit create request. And then like, boom, it was instantly there. And so it just got me to thinking like, you know, but, but, and, and that's why I pointed that out in the question, like, and I know it's huge reason, but besides having, you know, a physical copy of a card, which is a big deal for me and a big deal for collectors, like it just, it made me think of like, at the end of the day, like if you're only keeping your cards in a vault and you're just transferring them back and forth, is there really that much of a difference? Well, so. yeah, it, it almost sounds like a commercial <clears throat> endorsing vaulting and the mm -hmm. ease of vaulting when it comes to transacting on cards. I only use it to save on sales tax. And then I turn right around the downside of buying from fanatics that you still get pinged with this fulfillment fee. That's pretty large for the first 90 days. Whereas with eBay and PSA, once it hits, there's like a $6 charge and I'll show mm -hmm. a card here that where that saved me, you know, a thousand dollars by just vaulting it with PSA. Now, will that change in the future? I'm sure it will, but at least for you know, the next few purchases, maybe I, I can take advantage of that. But no, I, that's not good. That makes more sense now the way you explain it. I think it was it was positioned differently, almost like we're comparing the two, and it's like you know, they're so different. But yeah, I think when it comes to transacting with them, I like having them in my possession. I don't like vaulting. Like I said, I only use it for saving on sales tax. But I, I can understand why some people might want the security of having their cards in a vault. Um, but I, I just like holding them. That's the whole point of having them. Some of these cards, especially these cool '90s cards. It's, you know, in hand, they're totally different than they are yep. some image right on online. And while it's nice to have this, that security, I still would rather have it in my hands and possess it. So anyway, uh, any mail days, any pickups for you? Yeah, absolutely. But one last thing that I will say that I will say on the vault, you, you know, and, and I mentioned that I, I did fulfill or I, I, I kind of cleaned out my vaults. There were some cards that I had gotten that had been in there for like two years. And I'm like just now seeing the card. And I'm just like, this, <laughs> this just feels wrong. You know, like I feel like. If I have the card, you know, that's the biggest piece of it for me. If I don't have the card, I've, I've learned that it's a lot easier for me to let a card go that's not in my possession than one that's in my possession. Very true. Um, and so, you know, it's super easy to just say, hey, there's a picture of a card and I can go here and I can click, you know, sell them fixed price. I can sit, click send to auction. I can make a deal, you know, privately and just send it to the other person's vault. It's a lot easier to do it like that. And, you know, part of me for cards is having that attachment to it. So. That's yeah. the last piece I'll say as it relates to vaults and that sort of thing. Very good. But yes, I, I did have a mail day. Super exciting. I did post it on my Instagram page at Drake's PC for those who follow me um, for Peyton Manning. But this is his uh, 2006 uh, Bowman Chrome Super Fractor. Um, wow. It's a B BGS 8.5, 8 which you know doesn't really matter. But I, I kind of shared before, I, I own the red as well, too. Um, the red's out of five. Um, and so I... Um, an individual who um, I kind of shared a little bit of the story, an individual who knew I collected Peyton reached out to me and said, Hey, I've got this card. Would you be interested? And I'm like, absolutely. And he goes, well, um, I just sent it to BGS, but I'll let, let you know when, when I get it back. Um, and so he got it back. We quickly made a deal. Um, he sent it to me and I, I, I love that. There's lots of things I love about that card. Right. And I, I mentioned in my post that Bowman Chrome had one of ones before 2006, but 2006 is the first year of the Bowman Chrome Super Fractor in football. Um, and so I think that's significant. And I, and I do love the design of 2006 Bowman Chrome. There's um, yeah. some of the, like some of the other years are not my favorite. Like I'm not a huge fan of 2007, um, you know, j j like just to name one. Um, but, but it was awesome to get that card. Um, and, and, and also say too, like I'm going to end up letting the red go. Um, and, you know, the red's out of five. It's super rare, super scarce. There's you, like you just don't see them. Um, but part of my decision of going to get that super fractor was, hey, I've got this red, which is less rare, and I can, you know, let that go, let somebody else enjoy that card, um, and then use that money to help kind of pay myself back for getting that super fractor. So got it. Super excited to super excited to add that one to my collection. So 
this is not the journey we all go through. Part ways with cards, mm -hmm. get those more rare cards, so the cards that we really want. Well, yeah. I have a few. Uh, is that all you got, or is that? Well, that that's is that all you got? I love it. <laughs> well, I, I always feel like you got more than one, so I just want to make sure I don't. Get yeah, no, no. All right. Yeah, I mean that's it for this week. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, 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 it's sometimes tough to beat a uh, like a super fracture, but I know that you've got some uh, phenomenal cards to talk about, and it's actually our first question uh, from from Aesthetic Cards on Instagram. He said break down your grail purchase and congratulations so i know you've got a couple cards to share so let's talk about them yeah let's do that so i'll start with the the, the smaller ones they're not small in, in the state in the stature of uh the set and the prevalence and relevance of the set provenance whatnot is uh, craig biggio essential credentials now out of 34 22 out of 34. now it's craig biggio so you know i know this is one that's isn't going to break the bank it didn't um but it's I wanted a card from that now set. I have a, I have a um, Ken Griffey Jr. Future, same year, PSA 9. That's the bigger card, but this one is way more affordable. And it allows me to get a card of a Hall of Famer, 3,000 hit club. Uh, probably never going to be a huge card as far as value is concerned. But I just, you know, and looking at it in hand, the design, I mean, these now, it's just, wow. Like, just pops like the colors just pop so it's exciting to own a card of a card of a player that i used to like when i was younger um you know he's a strong catholic i'm a very strong catholic too so I, that, that was an identity identity there he's a houston astro so as a mariner fan it's kind of bittersweet <laughs> to to be buying any astro cards but this is from the 90s when i was rooting for everybody and they weren't playing the mariners in the 90s they were in the nl back then so but yeah really really cool card craig biggio and i picked up another craig biggio um I'm selling the mirror gold just because I, I needed to pay off another thing. And, you know, it was a PSA 8, and there's quite a few of them online. Um, so I felt like, but this one's actually uh, a little more rare. PSA 9 Red Crusade out of 25, 15 out of 25. So less than 35, two cards. You know, it's Biggio again. This is kind of a cool card. This card in the PSA 10 sold for about $2,000 in like 2017, I think. So it's always been a sought after card. I think the Red Crusade set itself. Is going to be a set that that you know gains some steam as people get right you know kind of getting back into the 90s and some of us at our age are, that are exploring those sets more i think that red crusade because it's it's really cool in hand um because it's really hard to see it you know yeah see it does have it, it's it's a nice refract and technology was pretty good donner's had some pretty cool foil tech technology back then so very yeah, cool. it, it's uh it, it's interesting so it's, first of all those cards are phenomenal and i and i remember back as a kid you'd open a pack of baseball cards and you'd get a craig biggio and you're like this is great you know like he was, well, one yeah, of those he, he was still he was still good yeah he was still you know yeah and uh but what was interesting and actually uh nick and brett talked about this on auction talk on stacking slabs and i think it's a good topic to bring up how you know the crusades in baseball have really taken off lately and it's interesting how in different um sets and sports and things like that where like it seems like baseball has long been popular oh, yeah. um and like, like like with the crusades mm -hmm. um and then now football may start to follow suit but then you have other sets where it's like basketball takes off first and then baseball or football follow. And then in right. some cases, football takes off first. And so it's interesting to me just to think about how, you know, in some in different sets, like something leads the way and then everything else follows. But it doesn't translate, you know, specifically across all sets in that same order. Right. And, and I'm still I mean, Craig Bridge is not a, it's not a, a card to sneeze at. I mean, it's still a card that should maintain. I don't think there's a big collector base for Craig Biggio. There might be Astro fans out there. There might be Bagwell fans that like to, to, to pair the two together. Um, he was a guy who had a really big year in 1994, along with the Montreal Expos having a really big year in 94. The Yankees thought they were going to win the World Series in 1994. Um, a lot of things were happening in 94. Griffey had a big year. The, the strike shortened a season. That I mean, there's there's a lot of storylines that were happening, and a lot of these players were kind of peaking. Um, I I always wonder what would have happened if the, the season actually finished because there's a lot of things. There's just, I mean, you can almost do a 30 for 30 on 1994 in baseball. There's lots of different storylines, lots of different players having career years. What would have happened if they would have finished the season and would have went into the playoffs and who would have won? Um, would the Expos have moved because maybe they made a long run? There wouldn't be the Nationals. It would change a lot of things. But um, yeah, so many things left undone by that strike. But that was one of his bigger years. 
but yeah, nine, 90, uh, 94 are not, the, the red crusades have always been like really sought after in the baseball community. They're a big card. The Griffey's really sought after. I don't like the grip. I mean, the cool thing about these Biggios is that his, he looks cool in these cards. Like he's got these cool, like they're good looking stand. I mean, he's, he's like chasing down grounders or he's running after a ball. The Griffey has this really wonky looking swing. Like he's swinging and missing in, in an ugly way. I mean, that's the only drawback on that card is just, it's kind of ugly is, is, you know, there's so many really cool cards of him where he looks great. I'll show another card that doesn't look all that great. It looks like he's, you know, looking like he's hitting a foul ball or hoping it goes fair. I don't know. Um, but those are two cool cards, uh, but those aren't the big ones. The big ones that I picked up, uh, the first of which is my rubies. This is the, this is really hard to kind of catch. In the Again, this even on, it's really, really tough. <laughs> this is the PSA 8, Barry Bonds, Star Rubies, 1999 Skybox Premium. And this one's out of 50, 21 out of 50. Um, really cool card. There's only a handful or just a couple of them out there. I think seven in total. I mean, I forgot. Not many. Um, I'm leaning into Bonds. I'm keeping my BGS 1087 Tiffany at Pop 4. Um, so I'm going to keep all three Bonds I have. And, and the other one I picked up was... Uh, this uh, 24 karat gold berry bonds. This card to me is probably going to be my biggest card in my collection when it's all said and done. Like I have the 87 PSA 10 Jordan. I think that'll be a decent card, but I think this card's going to just blow it out of the water. I think the rubies will be behind it. I think bonds is going to catch up to Griffey in value from a value perspective. And Griffey's is a $60,000 card, the PSA 10, but I think all the 24 karat golds of like prominent players from that era are going to command big dollar. Um, yeah, I used to have a Greg Biggio, Greg Biggio, uh, 24 karat gold, PSA 9. Last year, uh, sold it. Just to, I wanted to have a big card from a big set. That's kind of my, my play right now. I want a big player, big card, big set. Um, less cards, obviously. I don't get to have as many. But um, I feel like if, if all that capital is going to be tied up in a card, I wanted it to be a card that I feel like had a, a good long runway and an ability to improve in value. 24 karat goals are just they're just amazing so yeah those are that's the story behind that um sold a bunch of stuff to pay for it but uh i even had to let go of some griffies i didn't really want to let go of but uh had to do it and i, I scored with andy from uh bye bye uh bye bye baby cards bye bye baby cards yeah andy's a really great guy wonderful person to work with if you ever have a chance to work with him top shelf top notch one of the best Learned about him from the Precious Metal Gents podcast, which, again, one of my favorite podcasts now. Thanks to Drake turning me on to that. I think a lot of us um, 90s savants are, are kind of – we're all co congregating around each other between Brett with Stacking Slabs and Nick and, and, and the Precious Metal Gent guys. Um, uh, we're all kind of like circling each other a little bit there and just loving on these cards that, that mean something to us now. So, yep, yep, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. So, so phenomenal cards. Like you said, those 24 karat golds, like once you get them in hand, they just blow you away. I'm, I'm asked, um, I'm asked uh, if my Peyton is available all the time and the yeah. answer is always no. It's one of those cards that I just, I, it would be one of the last cards. I mean, the house would have to be crumbling down around me to let yep. go of that card. It's a, it's a beautiful yep. card. Um, the shine on those cards is like none other. And they're just, I mean, there's, there's 24 copies, but you just, you never see them. Uh, that set in football was around for one year. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just a, just a beautiful card. So I think I'm with you. I think these last two bonds pickups are probably the last two cards I'd sell. I, I might hang on to that Kobe um, super patch just because it's so rare. Um, but I think everything else goes. Maybe I keep a grip or two. But just because the sets are so, um, they're so, they're going, I believe they're already in crazy demand now. I think down the road, no one's going to be selling them. They're going to get gobbled up. And I think Hall of Fame players, prominent players should, should hold value. All right. Your big, big name players obviously will do really well. Um, will like the most, the average guy who never played very long, who just happened to have a card in that set. Will that do well? I don't know about that. But I've always been a proponent against that. It's, but it's, you know, if that's what you can afford to get your hands on a card from that set, then by all means, do it, right? Just because, yeah. again, the cards are so cool. Like, it's not everybody can afford the Kobe's or the Michael Jordan's or even the Peyton's or, or you know, uh, Jerry Rice's or the Barry Bonds or whatever. Maybe not everybody can get those. 
right. and get a card of a player that you like um, just to have the card. I, that's my advice because it's, it's they're getting expensive, but they're still attainable at some level. So, yep, exactly. All right, well, good stuff, and congrats on the pickups. Those were some Thank amazing you. cards and uh, great ninety stuff. So, we'll uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Um, this comes from Iowa Dave Sports Cards um, on Instagram, and um, I'm a huge fan of, of Dave or a friend of Dave. I'm a big fan of his show, The Shallow End. And so, yes, check out check, check out the great show. show. Yeah. Um, so, what his question was is is our topic was is how to cope when a card you badly want is priced far too high by an unreasonable seller. And I wrote to Dave and I said I think this was my crossover topic for the last like year and a half. Um, and, so, and so and so I said, can you maybe explain a little bit more? And he just said he wants to come at it from the perspective of how to accept the seller's approach rather than how to get them to change their mind since they clearly won't do that. He said he's got a couple of situations like that and basically one of them is a a, a card of someone he pcs is you know asking like 250 to 300 percent of comps um, for similar type cards it's been listed for nearly a year at the same price and then the other one um is is a card that somebody posted on instagram um at a at a, at a reasonable price and he missed it and then the guy who bought it now is listing that card on eBay for four times what he paid for it. And so Dave is sitting here going like, what am I supposed to do in this type of situation or what can he do to cope with it? So um, what thoughts do you have DPC? Well, it's interesting because you get that there, there, that does happen. Sometimes you see the price, you're like, that's not so bad. Then it goes and then it instantly goes back up for sale for way more. That always frustrates me to be honest. I feel like someone's just trying to make a lot of money off of, and that keeps the card from the true collector. And that can be very frustrating. However, I mean, if you buy the card, it's your card. And if it's in demand and there's not many of them and someone's going to have to, you know, pay the piper for the card, then that's the seller's prerogative. And I get to do whatever they want. I mean, it's like with you, there might be somebody out there that goes, I really want that Peyton Manning 24K gold. And, you know, Drake won't sell it. And that's not fair to me because I want to have one. And, he puts this astronomical price on it when it's probably only really worth this, but he puts it way up here and you're putting it way up there. I guess I should give the benefit of the doubt to somebody who buys a car. You're putting it way up there because, you know, if someone's willing to pay this then I'll accept it, but I'd rather keep it for everything less than that. Mm -hmm. um, if that's their true motive, then I guess you got to just wait it out. Like everybody's been telling you Drake for the last two years on the crossover, you got to just wait it out. Eventually it'll come back down or they're going to get tired of it. They're going to see that there's not a demand for it there. Maybe a couple people like you or I would Dave reach out and go, Hey, you know, I'm willing to come here. Are you even willing to meet me down here? And they're like, no, I need this. And it's like, all right. Um, I think there are less people doing that in our hobby right now than there used to be. Um, there's a card right now I'm looking at and the seller has it pretty, you know, the last sale was way, way less than what he's asking. And I was like, well, how would you go here? And he's like, you know, it's a really fair offer. It's probably more than it's worth right now, but I really need this number. We had great, they had great back, and very professional. Um, so there's, you, you know, I'd say, hey, if, if you ever consider coming down here, there's something, no, no big deal. <laughs> Sounds good, have a great day. You know, it, everything works out. So, so you just sort of like plant the seed and kind of just wait that that's one option and just hope that maybe someday they'll come back down. If they're a real collector and they're really trying to like, you know, I want to keep the card, it's going to be hard because they're probably wanting to keep it. Yep. There is a part of me that wonders why you post it for sale if you really intend to keep it, because I don't have any of these last, I mean, I'll be honest, the Vigios, if push came to shove, could probably go, but the Bonds, I wouldn't even post it. I wouldn't even put a number on it. Why throw it out there and have it go, right? You saw that Brett Favre just sold for a, like a buy it now for a big, big price, and I bet you that seller had no idea it was gonna sell for that, and someone just picked it up because they're like, wait a second, I need to get one of these cards while I can. And, and they did, a, they smashed the bite now. And now the seller's like, well, shoot, I didn't think anybody was going to do that. Exactly. So, and, oh, yeah, well, well, and just, just to jump in, that was the case on that. The guy put that there and thought, there's nobody that's going to buy it for this price. And it actually sold. And some other guys in a group chat saw the sale and they put it in the group chat. The seller actually had no idea that it even sold until he saw the group chat. And he goes, wait, my card sold? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I'm just going to put it way up here. There's no way I'm going to reach for it. But they did. I mean, maybe he just saw the writing on the wall. Some of those farms were going. So maybe, you know, the now went and then there was another one that went, um, I did the Ruby. So you, you'd think that maybe there's some traction there. 
the PMG or whatever, um, to where you maybe you need to be careful because there's a run on Favre right now. Um, but I just wouldn't even post it for sale if I'm never if I'm not intending to sell it at all, because you're also going to get people offering and you're going to get somebody's hopes up. So it, I'd almost rather it not be visible to me mm-hmm. with some crazy price. Maybe people in the comment section can comment on this. Like if you don't intend to sell it, don't post it and mm-hmm. create this anxiety in other collectors that want it or this frustration in other fr- collectors. And you're going to get Drake asking all kinds of questions on the crossover. If you keep doing that, you guys got to stop doing that. Just hide it away. He doesn't see it. He doesn't know who has it so that he doesn't have that anxiety. But yeah, I think you just have to grim. Just, you got to kind of wait it out and hopefully the create creator uh, build a relationship with the seller. Hopefully they're, they're reasonable. Most of them are, I think most people nowadays are. And especially the collector community, the real collector community, mm-hmm. and you know you, you'll probably eventually have an opportunity to obtain it. Yep. Yep. What do you think? No, for sure. Well, one of the things I asked Dave is I said, you know, what, what what type of cards are you talking about? Because I think it matters, right? And so one of them he said is a one on one, and so that was a case mm-hmm. I, you know, that I was in previously, where it was actually before National, and it was a Peyton Manning shield that Kevin Randall, the Captain Thirty Seven, had. And those of you that know Kevin and, you know, seen his Instagrams or podcasts and things like that, he's like, hey, you know, with Peyton, some of these cards are PC. These are my, my like Mount Rushmore type cards. If right. you want it, you got to come strong. And if you right. want this card, you got to pry it from his cold, dead hands. And those are his words. And so I knew, hey, this is a card I really want. And I've had my eye on it for three years. And if I really want this card, I've got to come strong for it. And that's what I did. And I think he, he respected that and respected the offer. It didn't really matter what he had paid for the card and, you know, when he got it and that whole sort of thing, it was, Hey, this is a a one-on-one type card and either I've got to wait it out and either the card gets more expensive or he just never moves it or something like that. And so, so I think it's important to, you know, let, let the owner of the card know that you're interested. um, Number one, um, because you never know when they may be in a situation where they need to move it for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, And so I think the other thing too is, um, don't, and, and, and the Kevin told me is other people were interested in that card, but nobody ever made an offer, right? I think they were scared to make an offer. And so I think it's like, don't be afraid to make an offer because even if it's over comps or something like that, it's a one-on-one. And so that may be your only shot at it. And so, you know, as long as you're comfortable with the price, um, and it's something that you really want for your PC, I think it's that, that, that that's something that you, that you got to do. The other thing is, is understanding who's holding the card. Right. So if you look at their page and for example, like with Kevin, I know he's a Peyton Manning collector, but I also know he's also a dealer. And so he here's some things that he's after, for example. And so while our transaction was a cash deal, I could have also gone out and looked for cards that would appeal to him as a dealer or maybe the person's not a dealer and they're a collector. You say, okay, this person, they super collect Craig Biggio, let's say, but they've got a Peyton Manning card that I want. Um, so maybe I go out and I find a bunch of, you know, rare and scarce Craig Biggio cards that this person might want. And then I could, you know, move that in there. And, and, and that's actually something that's happened to me before is I've said, Hey, you know, is there, is there, is there a card or, or a player that you collect that if I can find, you would do a straight up trade for this card. And they tell me what it is. And then that's kind of the next time, right? Because some people don't want cash. They just want to trade. So, um, so I think that's one way to look at it. The other thing is, is, you know, the, the other one was a star rubies. And as you know, and as you share, those aren't one of ones, they are super rare. They are super scarce, but I think you just have to be patient with those because, you know, while only one or two may pop up a year, you know, one or two may pop up. And, and so I think it's just be ready to pounce when those happen. Um, you know, so whether it's having cash ready or whether it's having cards to send to consignment, whether you use a card funding service, whatever the case may be, just know that those are rare and scarce. And, you know, I certainly think that you have to, to be, be ready to pounce when those come up because they certainly don't pop up a lot. And then kind of the same type situation is, you know, um, stay, stay in the DMs of that person, continually talk to them, find out what they collect, find out what they would be interested in and try to put something together that, that is, is appealing for them. And you know, the last thing I'll say that I've learned too is, um, you, you know, that Dave mentioned is he, is he missed out on it. And there's been multiple times where I've missed out on a card and I've had to pay a little bit of a premium and it stinks to do that. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's, you know, that, that, that person, 
got the card before you did. And so they're probably going to want a premium to have to move it. And I've been in that situation personally where I've gotten a card before someone else and then ended up, you know, kind of saying, hey, if you want this, it's here's what it's going to take. Um, and so I think it's just important to understand who has the card, um, be patient in some cases, um, and then be ready. So, yeah, I think I'll add, I'll add, add, add this to the conversation. I think there's two different types of sales and costs, all that. I mean, when it comes to transacting on cards, there's the people that the common cards, the liquid cards that have very strong comps that are very consistent and they sell often. You can look to them and go, yep, that's, I, I kind of know where I need to be. If someone's asking an astronomical amount over, you tend to get, um, you can just, okay, I'm going to get another opportunity for this card. I think it's, it, it's, it, it, I can be patient. Exercising discipline in our hobby is very difficult to do, but I think as a collector, you kind of need to do it with particular cards and you have to be ready to jump on a card that's really important. So when those really rare cards of players that matter show up, there's going to be an audience for them. You got to be ready. And the fact that they're rare, the fact that they're in that much demand is a good thing. It's a good sign, especially if you collect that player. It's a sign that that market's strong. It's a sign that there's a lot of people out there that want that card. Remember, if there's one card for sale, I need is two people that really, really want it for the drive the price up, right? Um, you, you'd like to think and hope it's not a show bid situation, but there's two people that really want it. Um, if there's two cards for sale, you got to have four people that really want it. So you got to think about the card, the, the, the collecting community. Um, but you just got to be ready to just jump on those cards. Those rare cards like that, there really are no comps. It's just basically whatever you're willing to pay and whatever that person's willing to, to take to let go of the card. And that's a back and forth thing. And Honestly, I kind of like that. I think that's uh, one of the things that's uh, um, exciting about our hobby is that like back and forth. Mm -hmm. That shows the health of the hobby. That shows the health of the the market for that particular player, or that or that 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 time frame of of cards like the '90s or the early 2000s or the '80s or vintage or whatever. So that, to me, that's a I love hearing the stories about. That's one of the reasons why I like that one uh, the, the PMG. Um, podcasts because they talk about yeah. those types of things and, and Nick and, and Brett talk about that kind of stuff and that's what's really cool so yes I have time for one more question we can do it buddy yep yep for sure and and, and the last thing I'll, that I'll say on that we talked at the beginning around you know vault transfers and blockchain and all that and how it's frictionless in a sense yeah. I think that's part of the fun of the hobby is the friction right yeah if, if everything was real easy and yeah. you didn't have to work hard and try different angles and you know, figure something out. It wouldn't be as fun. I mean, part of the the funnest part of the hobby is the chase and the acquisition story and all that sort of stuff. And so I think you know every acquisition story is different. Um, the length of time is different, so on and so forth. And so I think you know um, you just have to have to take each one kind of in a case by case scenario. And if you're you know you're going to sleep at night, you're waking up in the middle of the night, you wake up in the morning, and that's the only thing on your mind, and it happens multiple days, then. I think you just got to figure something out because that means you really want the card because some cases you may really want something because you see it and then you go to sleep and you wake up the next day and you're like, eh, I don't really feel about that the same way that I thought I did. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. That's right. well, and that's, sometimes these cards come available, like, you know, with, with Andy and getting this 24 K bonds, I didn't know I was going to get that card. He was liking and, and getting excited about the rubies I just picked up on, on Instagram. We started talking and I'm like, man, I loved your episode. It's really great. And it's like, you know, one of these days you get a 24K gold, it's just awesome. I love how you have so many of those. He's like, well, actually, you know, I've got a nine and I have an eight. You know, I'm, I might be, I might consider getting rid of the eight just because I'm, you know, he's doing his own consolidation to, to get a, his own, um, another bigger grill for him. And he's got two of them. Obviously, he's not just selling the only one because he probably wouldn't have sold it, right? But he's got another one and he's got the eight. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. So we walked in him. It was like, he wasn't completely ready yet, but I kind of pushed on it and pushed on it. And eventually we found a deal and made sense. And, so yeah, I mean, so these, these things just pop up and I think Instagram is a great place for it too. When you show off your cards, you know, it sometimes gives you an audience for, for people to go, Hey, Oh, I didn't know you're into that player. I, I have this card. What do you think? And it's, uh, it's exciting. The whole prospect is exciting. And sometimes you just have to pass cause you're just like, I'm not there. I don't have enough to, to get that, but thank you for thinking of me and I'll keep, I'll keep that in mind for the future. So yeah, that whole process is really fun. It's fun to listen to the stories from other collectors and what they go through. To me, it's one of my favorite things to listen to. Is that whole because I know what it's like the feeling and it's exciting and to see other people um, be able to get the cards they want like you getting that that's exciting you know the whole hobby's talking about it it's fun you know it's it makes it way more enjoyable you kind of share your experience with everybody else so yep uh, no, exactly great question yep. Dave. it's a 
Wait, our last question. This comes from uh, Mad Mad City Collector uh, James, and he said I talked about you know the acquisition of the '98 Credentials Future Manning, but he said, "Can I share more about my conviction to put so many resources into this card, as well as the decision to disclose the price of this private sale by a card ladder?" I've definitely entered full uh, card radical territory that Chris Hoge talks about. Um, which <laughs> <I'll be right. laughs> So, so I'd say, you know, there, I'll, I'll try to keep this brief, but putting, you know, so many resources into this card. Um, I've talked about getting back into hardcore collecting Peyton Manning back in 2021, you know, collecting him as a kid. And when I came back to the hobby, I saw that credentials future and I had known about it and I wanted the card. And one went to auction and I wasn't there mentally to say, OK, I'm ready to put this money into a card. But as the hobby evolved for me and I got more, you know, belief in the hobby and you start to put more disposable income and resources and you further educate yourself and things like that, you know, in some cases your budget may grow and because your belief grows and you're more comfortable putting more money into a specific card or cards in general and things like that. And so, um, you, you know, as, as one went to auction and I missed it back in, what was it, 2022, I, I like lost sleep over it. I was disappointed because I was like, I should have gone harder for the card at, yeah. at that time. And so I kept, you know, talking to collectors that I knew who had copies and kept after it. And it was one of those ones where I just thought I was never going to get one because I knew the other collectors who had copies of that card had diamond hands. They're not selling the card. This card is not one that's just going to, you're waking up one day and it's in a Fanatics premier auction. That's not the way this card gets transacted anymore based on who is now holding the card. And so I think that just further created my conviction behind it. And then it was kind of painful to watch and sit on the sidelines as the 90s market grew and people got more convicted around credentials and PMG and rubies and all that sort of thing. And so I think it just got to a point where when other folks had told who had owner or who owned the card, similar to Dave's question, were giving me prices it would take to pry that card from them. I'm like, I just, I can't do that. And then finally, when John gave me a price that was less than that, as I mentioned before, I'm like, gosh, this is a lot of money and it would require a lot of consolidation into my collection. But I've been thinking about this card for years. And it's something that when I looked at what I had, um, I, I said, hey, I've enjoyed these cards for a long time and it's time to let somebody else enjoy them so that that way I can enjoy this one card that I've wanted in my collection for years now. Um, and so that was really the conviction behind, um, I guess, making that acquisition and completing the purchase because I, you know, it wasn't something where I just woke up one day and saw it and I thought, wow, that'd be a real cool card to add. It's something that had been on my mind for years and I've been talking about to multiple people about trying to get one. And when you know the other holders of the card, um, someone asked me today, like, when do you think the next time that credentials future will come up for sale? And I said, it's going to be years, right? And I doubt it. The next time it transacts, it's probably private. And the, the private transaction would probably include a trade because, you know, someone may say, hey, I have one, but I would rather have a Michael Jordan grail than this card. And so if this person can find that Michael Jordan grail, then, hey, maybe that's a trade that person is willing to make. So that's a that, that, that just furthers my belief that now is the time to pounce versus later um, because I don't I don't see that card getting any cheaper um, and I don't see it becoming, um, you know, publicly available unless something crazy happens, which sometimes happens, but um, something crazy. And then just the final piece there around the um, decision to disclose the, the sale, the sale of this. I, I, I actually did that, I'll say, from personal reasons, because. I find that, and I actually had this happen to me to me yesterday um, when I was doing a story sale. Um, I posted the sale of a of, of a Breeze or posted a Drew Breeze 2014 Finest Superfractor, and somebody came to me and offered me on the uh, the card and said, "Hey, here's what I'll give you," um, and it's based off the, the the public sale of that in 2022. And I'm like, "Well, that's not what it's worth now because." Like, here's what I think it's worth. And I can show you other sales of Breeze Superfractors that are more recent than that. And I can just kind of uh, see that. And so, like, when you look at something like Card Ladder and it shows that, hey, the last sale 
of that credentials future was, I don't know, $57,600. And then it says like estimated card ladder value today is like, I don't know, 25 grand or whatever it was. Like that's not correct. And so what I'm trying to do by disclosing that is not so much for me because I know what it's worth. I know what other holders of the card think it's worth. I'm just trying to give more provenance from a debt from a data standpoint to hopefully help other collectors who may be looking for similar cards from that set um you know or other similar type cards just to give the data behind like hey here's what's going on behind the scenes um and just trying to to help with things from a data standpoint and from a provenance standpoint so that way you've got some more recent data to help understand when you're making a deal both buying and selling no really good stuff man that's a that's a a great way to look at it. I think they're, I'm very bullish on cards. I'm really, really bullish on the 90s and a lot of the bigger players. I do think some of those sets um, are going to age well. And I think there's a lot of people that have a lot of not only resources, but they may have card capital that they could use to get into some of these cards. And they might start doing that. And I think a lot more have card capital than we know. Um, and I think a lot more people are going to start doing that to uh, maybe get into some of this stuff. And you don't have to spend ungodly amount of ungodly amounts of money either. I think there's ways to get in um, on the ground floor with some pretty cool players. So um, if it's something you enjoy, if it's a, if, if, if these are sets that you like and you're in, interested in, in looking into them, um, definitely think about a player that, that was kind of off the beaten path that you still really enjoyed that played for your favorite team. Um, there's players like that that I think we all have, and, and there might be a way to get into some of those cards um, relatively cheap and still enjoy the card itself. Like, you know, I just did with Vigio. It's like it's still hold it it's so cool um highly recommend doing that if, if you're if that, that's within your your uh your resources or, or uh, appropriate for it but uh i, I just man I, I it is it's it's never ending i think there's a lot of hobby topics so there's all the different drama topics that are going on but i just can't get enough of this this kind of conversation and, and if, if you folks aren't really enjoying it i'm really sorry I know that Drake and I are really kind of in the thick of it. We really enjoy this, this, these topics and, and this type, these types of cards, these types of players. Um, they're really exciting. It kind of gets you more focused and honing in on what you want to collect and, and what you want to keep, what you want to hang on to. And I think a lot of us are narrowing that down and going, well, I only really want these cards. Well, you know, I don't have the cash to get them, but I do have some cards I can use to get them. And, and so that's why a lot of these things are, are popping up, the fun your card stuff. Um, I'm not going to promote anything like that, but, I, you know, I do – we all do use our cards to, to pay for other cards that we want to buy because none of us have the kind of cash line around for that. But unfortunately we do have the cards and you just have to make those tough decisions sometimes, unfortunately. And there's some people are like, you know, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm happy collecting what I'm collecting and there's nothing wrong with that. And that's the beautiful thing about our hobby um, is that we can do this in any way you want. So um, anyway, Hey, it was a great topic, great topics today. A lot of fun talking about it. Um, I hope everybody's having a great summer. I'm going to say this next week when we get together, I'm going to be in school. So next week I'll be coming from a dorm room. I'm pretty sure, but we're going to Drake and I are going to name off our top three 90 sets. That's what we're going to do. I just made that decision. Drake didn't even know that we're going to top. We're going to, we're going to top off three, just three. That's going to make it tough because there's probably four or five sets that are pretty rad and pretty awesome. And that's going to make us have to choose three. We're going to pick three sets. We believe 10 years from now are going to be the sets that lead the way and are going to be the big ones that, that kind of like uh, they're going to be the Mount Rushmore types of sets in the future that our, our age group, you know, 35 to 55 are going to be like, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got X, Y, or Z uh, cards that we feel confident about. Now we're just going to be predicting it. Who knows? We're not telling anybody to go buy anything or any of that kind of stuff, even though I've kind of recommended it earlier. Um, everybody's each their own. You make your own decisions. We're not, buy, we're not promoting any of that, but, we love these sets, and we're going to come up with the top three. So all of you who have watched this episode, come next week with your top three. So you can comment in the comment section what your top three are. Heck, you can do it now if you want, but what your top three sets are from the 90s. Heck, they could be 92 tops gold for all I care. What are your top three sets that you love, you enjoy, that bring you joy, um, that you loved collecting when you were younger or you've gotten, you've kind of found and, and really in, uh, kind of fell in love with? as you've gotten back into the hobby or as of late. So top three sets. That's what we're going to do. Stick to the 90s. Um, yeah, everybody have a great rest of your week. Thanks for listening to us yak on and on about 90s cars and, and picking up some cool cards and grails and all that good stuff. Um, we hope you guys enjoyed it. You can like, comment below. Subscribe to Dustin's channel. Appreciate everything. We got our stuff up on Spotify. So you can check us out there if you missed an episode. Take care, everyone.